So I'm here to talk to you guys about the history of fetching specs. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Heroku for allowing me to work on open source and investing in the Ruby community. And secondly, I'd like to do something a little special. Um, uh, in February, I went to RubyConf Australia, and Corey Haynes gave this keynote, and he talked about uh, Emu March, which is essentially emulating someone that inspires you for a month. And Aaron Patterson has been a great mentor and friend to me over uh, my last few years in the Ruby community. And one of the things, uh, besides his code and all the other things he does, I enjoy all the positive energy he brings into the community. And I think Friday Hugs is like, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, he takes a picture of himself, uh, I guess, like hugging the camera. In this case, he takes a picture of his cat hugging the camera, and then he tweets it out onto the internet, and it gets retweeted a bunch, and just kind of just makes your Friday uh, just kind of happy. And so as I've gone speaking at conferences around the world, I've gone and taken Friday hug pictures at various conferences, and they look really awesome. And I also got dubbed this title, Friday Hug Superhero for doing this. So, uh, and continuing in this tradition, and since it's also Friday, I'd like to take a Friday hug photo with all of you. So if you guys can all stand up and uh, look like you're hugging the camera, that'd be awesome. Awesome. Ready? One, two, three. Thanks, guys. OK, so on to the actual talk. So I'm here to talk to you guys about the history of fetching specs. And you're probably wondering how this applies to you or why you should care about it at all. Um, and if you use Ruby, you've probably used gems and other things. So you've interacted with Ruby gems. Uh, so you might run a command similar to this, like gem install Sinatra. But there's a bunch of things uh, that happen to even get to the point that you can download the gem and unpack it. So within this simple command line, gem install Sinatra, you have to figure out what the latest version of Sinatra is and then all of its dependencies to go and fetch those so you can actually run the program. And in Sinatra's case, that's like rack, rack protection, and tilt, I believe now. Um, and, and in addition, you've probably also used Bundler if you're using Rails or in your other projects. Uh, Bundler, if you don't know, is the, an application dependency manager for Ruby. And similarly to Ruby gems, uh, well, in Bundler, you can configure a gem file and then list the gems you need and then point to any sources that you get them from. And then you run a bundle install to go, and similarly, it needs to figure out what gems are available on Ruby gems to actually go and download them and install it, and then construct that dependency graph of all the gems you actually need to run your application. So my talk is about walking through the various parts of ways we've been able to get that information and how we've looked at it and tried to make that better. Uh, so the first one here is the modern index. So this is the way that when you run gem install of what is actually done. Um, it uses the modern index right now. And then in the Bundler 1.0 days, or if you use the full source index in Bundler 1.1 plus, uh, it goes and downloads this and um, uses it to find all the information it needs just to sort of construct that dependency graph there. And so you can actually go and fetch uh, the modern index uh, right off of rubygems.org. Uh, they make it available. You can just wget it. And looking at the size, it's only, I did this on Monday this past week, and it's only one and a half megs. So not too large um, when it's compressed. And inside of it, it's just a marshaled array of these tuples. So there's a, this tuple set for every single gem in the index of every gem version and platform that you can install off of rubygems.org. So in the example here, you have the gem name, which is Sinatra, the gem version, which is 132, and then the platform, which for most things is Ruby, unless you're using some type of native uh, thing, like in Nokogiri, you might have Java or MS Win 86 uh, for Windows or something like that. Um, so one of the problems here is uh, we can look at all those Sinatra tuples to figure out what the latest version is, or if you specify a specific version, the version that you need to actually install. But nowhere in there is any of the dependency information that you need to install to actually run the rest of the library. So 
you have to go and fetch this other file, and RubyGems provides these gem spec files that actually have this information. So if we go and download it, you see that uh, the dependencies are available, and we can go ahead and now get those and install those gems. Um, so the next problem is that this index keeps growing over time and takes up more space, and it is every single gem and gem version that has ever existed, and that only gets worse every single day as uh, the active community, which is thriving, keeps pushing more and more gems. Um, and back in the old Bundler days of Bundler 1.0, on an old, uh, on a Linode instance of 256 megabytes, you couldn't even do a bundle install of Rails because it would take more memory than you had in the machine uh, because you had to, even though the gzip file is only one half megs, you have to load that whole object graph into memory, and it would take a ton of space um, in addition to the other things Bundler is doing. So um, it was definitely a huge problem uh, when working on Bundler to just use the source index of using more memory. And uh, since the dependency graph was so large, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this XKCD comic where we replace compiling with bundling. Uh, and oftentimes, like, people run bundle install after, uh, like, updating their Git repo or cloning a new fresh checkout of some project. And then you basically have to wait a really long time for your dependencies to install. It was kind of a huge drag. So off that simple gem file example that we had before of just gem Sinatra, um, on my machine it took about a little under 18 seconds, which for installing four gems is a really, really long time. Um, so luckily uh, for us, the rubygems.org team of Nick and then some guys from ThoughtBot came up with this dependency API to kind of help solve those issues there that we were seeing. So the dependency API was this endpoint that uh, exists on rubygems.org, and you can hit it, and you can pass basically this comma-separated value list of all the gems that you wanted to get uh, information on, and it would return the first level dependencies back. So you can imagine a simple recursive function where you would take your top level gems from your gem file, pass that in, and then keep iterating until you kind of have that complete dependency graph and you're not, you aren't getting any more new dependencies back. Um, so if we look at the output of the gem, of the, when we're hitting that URL, we can see that it returns a marshaled array of a hash, and so there's an entry for this for every gem version platform, and it has the dependencies in addition to all the stuff from the modern index. Uh, so this allows us to skip hitting uh, that gem spec file for every gem that we need this information on. So if we go and look at those problems that I just listed uh, with the modern index that we were trying to solve, uh, we can see that, great, so now we don't have to fetch that dependency info, so that thing is solved there. In addition, since we're limiting the scope of the information we're downloading, uh, we're only querying against the gems that we're interested in uh, based off of your gem file. Uh, we don't actually have to fetch every single gem ever that's in that index. So we've decreased the whole scope of like, what the, the dependency graph has to sort of search through. So we're using a lot less uh, memory there. And then more importantly, it was also just faster. So in that case of that gem file in Bundler 1.1, we were able to cut this down to about three seconds, uh, a little over three seconds, which is simply faster than 18 seconds. Um, but at the same time, we found that when we released this, after the fact that it wasn't problem-free, like we actually ran into other issues there too. So looking at the first problem here is that uh, the API endpoint was not cacheable at all. We tried caching it. I know in the original rubygems.org implementation, we used Redis uh, to sort of generate the query instead of just hitting Postgres every time. Um, but one of the problems is, uh, every single gem file has different gems in them, and you'll query it, and you'll, you're, you're going to like increase the caching that you're going to need pretty significantly just to sort of save the computation, which means most of the times you're going to have to actually compute that result set every time to return back for the API endpoint. So a really simple example here is that at the end, we only change baz to boo, uh, but that means that we have to construct that whole result set, and you can't really share between those two things, even though only one gem is different. 
we have to run a whole new query every single time. The second thing is that you guys push a lot of gems in this community. So there's, I think this stat was given to me a year ago uh, when uh, the API endpoint was around. Um, and there's a new gem version pushed every single five minutes, and I'm sure that's increased now. So that means in the previous example of just like hitting that endpoint, if there's a new gem version pushed, you have to invalidate that cache and be able to return a new result set. And so since this happens often enough, it's probably like you'd have to come up with a pretty good heuristic that would go and like know when to invalidate certain caches and when not to. And we just end up not caching at all for simplicity's sake to just redo that calculation because oftentimes it might be wrong. Um, and so in this case, we couldn't cache it on HTTP end or uh, reliably use a data store. Um, which leads to kind of our second problem here was that uh, we were hitting the Postgres database every time and we actually had, we used this query here actually in the app code to kind of do that. So inside of the SQL query, there's like this nested select and then you do these two like left outer joins and uh, you imagine like, I've looked at a bunch of uh, gem files from doing support stuff at Heroku and people have pretty ridiculous gem files. Like I've seen stuff where you have when you do bundle show and do like the WC-L on it and pipe it to that, it's like somewhere of two, 300 gems. So these are like massive applications, right? And you imagine like this query is gonna get pretty big um, and it has to compute this every time someone makes a query. And this is the endpoint that's being used by everyone in the Ruby community. So most of the times it's actually been pretty responsive, but anytime it like slows down or not, like it stalls the server and potentially you might uh, take more than 30 seconds to even compute that. And then in that case, in Bundler, we've just fallen back to the source index because that only took 30 seconds to kind of do that whole thing. So if the API is not faster, then we're not doing anything actually better here. And the third problem is that uh, since this is an actual app that's being run and maintained by people, uh, it's like an actual operation burden. So one of the really nice things about the original source, uh, the modern index, was that it's a flat file. So uh, you can run it locally, you don't need to set up an app server, you don't have to have Postgres, you don't have to have any of that stuff, you just need to have those files and you can bootstrap it really easily locally on your machine. Um, and then because it has to be operated, uh, it's run by a bunch of volunteers. Um, so right now, uh, Larry Marberger is the main, I guess, maintainer and uh, steward of the API endpoints uh, for Bundler and uh, he's done a bunch of work but at the same time, he has a full-time job working at Cloud App. He has a wife and kids and a family, so you know he's only working on this part-time. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, we have a pager duty system in place. But at the same time, we're also you know we all have our own lives, and, and um, you know like we have to go through a bunch of stuff to to work through all this. Um, and if you guys remembered, uh, there was one point where this API endpoint uh, went down on rubygems.org and it actually took rubygems.org down and we had to disable it and then work on a solution to actually bring it back up. So definitely there are like operational burdens and it is not always reliable and up all the time. And the other thing is uh, since that instant, uh, Heroku was generous to sponsor uh, this, the, just that endpoint. Um, and so that means it runs in US East. Um, and since we're already strapped for working on other things, we haven't been able to spin up uh, like a Europe zone. So uh, in Paris, like when you run bundle install, you're going all the way over the ocean to Virginia to hit this API endpoint. And we can definitely do something that's better than that. Um, so we've settled, we've been thinking and talking about uh, this stuff. Um, I know Evan Phoenix and James Tucker have had a lot of input and have helped with making this new index format. And so we're hoping this thing will help solve a lot of the issues that we had in the past. And the index format's composed of basically three main parts. So the first thing we have here is that we have this names.list. And it's this simple uh, plain text file. There's a new line for every single gem in the index. So pretty simple, pretty easy to generate. Um, uh, nothing really complicated here. And next we have a versions.list file. And so this is every single gem is on a new line and 
Then we have, to the right of it, uh, every single version that's ever been released that is in the index that isn't yanked. Uh, and then we also list any platforms and sort of combine those. So you see in the example of Nokia here, we have the, MS, the x86 MS-132. So that's the platform there, and it's combined with uh, version 1.0.0. And then the final piece here is that there's this depths folder, and then we have a file for every single gem that is in the index. And inside of this file, we have all the versions that have been released, and then to the right of that, all the dependencies for those versions. Um, and so you can imagine like a directory full of all this stuff. Um, and the, and like I often get. Like when I first looked at this uh, proposal, I was kind of wondering like why didn't we do this in some kind of pre-done format like YAML or JSON? And the reason we've done it this way is for a bunch of performance reasons. Um, like we can write a partial that's pretty fast, and we can write stuff that's easily compressible. Uh, so to give you some context here, uh, when we look at sizes, we just look at that depths folder. If you take and run this and generate a depths file for every single gem in Ruby Gems. It takes about 200 megabytes. Uh, and to, or, to get the same information with all the dependencies, we'd have to, in the modern index, download all the gem spec files. And that takes about 1.1 gigs. So if you want to cache this at all locally, like 200 megabytes seems a lot more feasible than 1.1 gigs, um, especially when you have to process that all. And then if we gzip these files at all, you can drop it down to 2.7 megabytes. Uh, the gem specs are clearly pretty compressible because you can compress that down to 20. Um, and then if we go and look at the form performance of this stuff, and so for these tests uh, and these benchmarks, basically what we did is we went through and just processed in memory and loaded all of the depths files. Uh, or in the case of the old stuff, we would go and load all the gem specs. So we can see that the performance is pretty comparable between the new index format and the modern index. So the new index format, uh, we see it's like 0.838 seconds in total, and then uh, when I ran it one time. Uh, and then on the old modern index, it takes about 858. So you're looking at like pretty comparable performance there. Um, but I think where the key wins are, uh, so before you would have to download, uh, like if you're looking at something, you'd have to download a bunch of different versions of a particular gem spec potentially. And then now we just have one file. So if we wanted to look at Rails here, it only takes like 0.1 second to kind of load that one uh, dependency there. Uh, so uh, during a bundle install, you can imagine, or even a Ruby gem install, you can imagine just loading the appropriate files that you need there and not having to do nearly as much work. Uh, the other thing that we were really striving for is something that was HTTP cacheable so we could scale it. And when something's HTTP cacheable, we can use something like a CDN, and a CDN brings a lot of performance uh, to it. So Larry's done a bunch of work to try out Fastly, and uh, if you've been following the Ruby gems Twitter account, uh, we've been trying to experiment it with rubygems.org just serving the static files that are on there right now. And so if uh, it's already loaded and cached on that server uh, that you're hitting for Fastly, it takes on average less than a second most of the time um, versus like S3 CloudFront, or, uh, which is where it's hosted now. It usually takes over two seconds, somewhere between two to three seconds uh, from the benchmarks that I've seen uh, so far. And the other nice thing is that we get this global reach uh, with using a CDN, um, and this is similar to CloudFront. So Instead of hitting the API dependency endpoint uh, that's hosted in America, if you're in France, you can hit something that's significantly closer. So we get this like global reach, and you never really have to hit uh, anything that's like too too far away. Um, and the other thing we can do here is uh, with Ruby Gems and Bundler, we can sort of cache those things locally. So you imagine all these flat files; uh, you can have those things locally instead of having to re-download them every time. Uh, you can only download potentially the diffs. And so stuff we've looked into implementing is partial cache busting. And what I mean by this is we can use stuff like e-tags to, uh, so when a new gem gets pushed, we know to only, we have to invalidate that particular cache for that particular gem. And if you're not using that, then it doesn't matter. Like, your cache is up to date. But if you are using that gem, when you run bundle install or gem install, we know to update only that particular thing because we know that it's been uh, invalidated. Um, so we can download a, we can hit a much smaller amount of network traffic there. Um, 
And then in the old dependency endpoint, we haven't been gzipping any of the output. So gzipping, as you saw before, significantly decreases the amount of network traffic we have to do there. So even if you're farther away from the CDN, you can still cut down network traffic time. Um, and in addition, um, so in that recursive method, we tried to decrease the amount of HTTP calls we were doing, like minimize them by passing like a bunch of gems to that API query. And so in this case, since we have to make more HTTP calls, we can use HTTP pipelining or a, a, an HTTP connection pool to sort of, in each recursive call, like hit all those things and get it to be much more performant there. So uh, all this stuff is, uh, is stuff we're working on now, and we're hoping it will come out fairly soon. Um, and so sometime after Bundler 1.4, which is what we're working on now. Um, so I have a plug for Bundler 1.4. Uh, we're actually in the RC cycle of it. Um, and one of the really cool features of Bundler 1.4 is that we've worked on this parallel install feature. And so traditionally in Bundler, when you do a bundle install, if you're installing like 300 gems, you have to sequentially wait for them. And then if you're compiling extension, you have to wait for that extension to compile to sort of compile the next thing. And in this one, we can spin up a bunch of job processes to sort of process uh, things in parallel. So in this case, you can have four processes being worked on simultaneously. Um, so you can, depending on the number of CPU cores you have, uh, in MRI, it, uh, it's done with worker processes and JVR using threads here. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all the other people on Bundler Core. Uh, I know Jessica Suttles is here um, at .rb, um, but both Andre and Larry have both been super helpful, and then all the other contributors to Bundler as well uh, for working on all this stuff with me. Um, so yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs>